he had such a bad speech impediment um, at the age of four that he went to speech therapy. And so the thought that dad would even get through a sentence at the age of four, you know, with polio and, um, you know, a, a really bad speech impediment, the fact he'd go on. And there was this really spooky story. I think, I think if I'd written the book this year, not to say that what was in it or the content would be different, but the experience of writing it would be very different if I had sat down to start writing it now. But I was lucky enough to travel with my parents and meet people from all walks of life. And as, you know, there's no better experience than that in terms of being able to adapt to different people. Um, but I also got a masterclass in... Hello and welcome to The Creative Revolution, the home of creativity, imagination and innovation in action, inspired by my late father-in-law, Sir Ken Robinson. We are a community that believes in the incredible potential of our individual and shared creative capacities. I'm Anthony, the CEO and co-founder of The Creative Revolution, and today I have the pleasure of interviewing someone very special to me. She's an international author, an award-winning educationalist, an inspiring public speaker, as well as my wife, co-founder and co-host of The Creative Revolution, Kate Robinson. For this first episode, I wanted to ask Kate some things I felt other interviewers may have missed. I wanted to know what it was like growing up with Sir Ken as her father, what his life was like growing up, and how their world changed and how it continues to change. This podcast showcases the remarkable stories of the people that define modern culture and achieve greatness through their use of creativity, imagination and innovation. We're advocating for a revolution in how we view the world around us and the world within us, and that starts with the individual. So join us on this exciting journey and let's get started. Welcome to the Creative Revolution Podcast. Thank you. You're welcome, Warren Shop. Um, I'm wearing branded attire. I am the brand. <laughs> <laughs> Wrote the book. Does that scare you <laughs> that you're the brand? No, but I have um I have sort of stopped wearing my jumper a little bit. Why is that? On on the school run and things like that. Um it was one thing when we were like pushing the book when it first came out and now um maybe I should get one that's not yellow. Why? I love the yellow and I have a thing about yellow, as you know, but I wonder if I should have a black or white one. Well, I, it's I, a I, hint. My birthday's in May. <laughs> I'm not getting you. You're, <laughs> you've just called yourself the brand. You can't then say, <laughs> I'm I would kidding. Like, I am not the brand. <laughs> I, I would like I'm just not branded. I've got a branded mug. There you go. You're a there branded mug. <laughs> I, for my birthday, I would like an Imagine If jumper done. Yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, so how many books do you think you sold on the school run based on your yellow jumper? I don't know how many books I have sold, but I have started a number of conversations. There we go. Based on the jumper? Yeah, even one, the first day I wore it, I wore it to the park with Adeline and someone came over and said how much they loved my jumper. I think because it was yellow. A complete randomer. Complete randomer. Oh, and then turned a... out she homeschooled. And so how long did you have a conversation with that person? Well, then we stood and sort of the kids played and... And, and then we went our separate ways, never to see each other again. <laughs> oh, <laughs> if you're out there. <laughs> I was wearing a yellow jumper at the park. <laughs> <laughs> but this isn't a conversation specifically to start off with a buy our merchandise. <laughs> but I'm just literally saying I turned up to represent you. Well done. Which, thank you. I appreciate that. And I do wear it quite a lot, which is also really cool. And it can be found in the shop at any one point. <laughs> in a range of colours. <laughs> But how was the book, firstly, in terms of the writing of it? I was there. I've been credited for making new cups of tea. You did make me cups of tea. Actually, how, how many cups of tea did you make? Oh, three. I was going to say, because <laughs> your office was above mine. <laughs> the kitchen is below. Yeah, I was tealess as well, to be honest. Yeah. Um, it was intense writing the book, now with hindsight on it. Um, it was a very quick turnaround. The, the publisher got in touch. So what dad passed away in... August 2020 and I think Penguin probably got in touch around September yeah. to ask if I could have it ready for May yeah. and I confidently was like yeah I'm fine yeah. sure um but as you know then we went into Imagine If and I didn't start writing the book really until April April yeah um and had a brilliant I had three editors in the book all of yeah. whom were are fantastic the first one I had was Victoria um and we really wrote it together so I would send her chapters weekly so I think I turned in the final 
draft in July, um, June, July. Yeah. But all that to say, it was, it was what, three months of writing. I didn't do anything else for three yeah. straight months. And I miss that. Why? Um, I like writing and I like, I mean, I'm not great unless I have a deadline. So it was nice to have weekly check-ins. Mm-hmm. Um, that was very helpful. I liked getting to read all of dad's work again and disappear into his world. Um, yeah, there was a freedom to it. And I remember sort of when I sat down and finished it, I think the last thing I did was acknowledgements because I don't know if anyone else who's written a book agrees, but I found that the hardest part because you're so terrified you're going to, I'm sure I did miss people off. Um, that person in the park. <laughs> that person in the park. <laughs> um, but I remember when I finished, I sort of, this is going to sound possibly bizarre, but possibly not depending on your belief systems. I sort of felt dad go. And it wasn't even that I'd been aware that he was in me for the time of writing the book. But when I'd finished, I suddenly missed him all over again. Yeah. Cause I think I'd been in his headspace and trying to get him into mine and the books written in his voice. So I'd really been channeling him for, you know, and it was still in the first year of loss. And if anyone's lost somebody, you know, that first year is, well, they say the first year is about survival. The sec- second, second, the second year is about, um, endurance, which I think is probably true. So where were you at the time when you were writing? I mean, I started writing at six months after dad died. So denial, squarely in the realm, of <laughs> squarely in denial. Yeah. Uh, it was a nice way to keep him. I think, I think if I'd written the book this year, not to say that what was in it or the content would be different, but the experience of writing it would be very different if I had sat down to start writing it now. Um, Why but, would that be? I didn't know you'd ask that. Okay. Nah, don't take me up. <laughs> because um, it is just different nearly three, you know, two and a half years on versus half a year on. You know, I'd just seen him six months before. Yeah. And we'd been working on it very closely together and it was all very fresh in my head and my mind and his voice was still very fresh in my head. And being able to write in his voice came from having had so many conversations with him about it, not from copying his writing style. So I think if I tried to write it now, it would be much more a kind of copycat as opposed to a poltergeisty yeah. um, flow. Because you wrote it together, yeah. didn't you? Um, and I'm sorry to start off with this, it's right. but I think it's really important. Can you talk more? I don't think I've heard you talk through that writing process properly, including how... Um, We've made a joke about what your dad possibly passed you for the book, <laughs> which I don't want to. <clears throat> I don't want to get him in trouble and him look down on me and think you get smited. Uh, yeah, smote. I, yeah, I don't want to be smote. See, that's <laughs> possibly why I've done the uh, the lightning bolt just in case. Um, but could you talk through, if you don't mind, to everybody the experience you had because your dad was writing his manifesto, wasn't he? Yes, um, dad had been writing his manifesto since the original deadline was 2017. So it had been... Be careful with lightning. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think if he was here, he'd say the same thing, but he'd... Um, what his, his book before that was You, Your Child in School that came out in 2016. So they were pretty quick to give him a new commission, you know, hot off the heels of that. Um, and yeah, the, the original deadline was 2017. Um, and I... If, I think, he, I think he needed more of a break between writing books. Um, he'd said he didn't particularly want any more deadlines at that point, but also a manifesto. And actually, you know, this is a sort of internal confusion that's come up a couple of times, not, not between you and me, but um, about whether or not the book is an overview of his life's work or an introduction to it. And I think he always saw it as an introduction to it, which is what Imagine If, I hope, is now. Yeah. Um, but... It's you, you kind of have to begin that from an overview point of view. And I think his, his, he struggled to find different ways to say what he'd already said. Um, and it was, I've said this before, but it was always a running joke that if dad blew you off to write the manifesto, he was just blowing you off. <laughs> um, because he'd, and he had various different goes at it, but the, the version he gave me was, um, more outline than substance. Right. So we worked on it together when he, when we knew he was dying. He'd asked me to work on it before we found out he was dying. Um, but obviously we sort of thought we'll wait until you're better before we start working on it. And then he wasn't getting better. So we, 
push those conversations forward. And I've got a photograph of it, which I'll probably never share because he's so sick in it. Um, but I cherish the photograph of him in bed and me sitting on the other bed in the room and just sort of scribbling down notes. Yeah. Um, furiously. And he kind of took it upon himself to just speak, you know, for hours at a time about, um, about where his inspiration came from, where his work came from, where his ideas came from. And I kind of scribbled notes and, um, you know, if you've only got 18 days, we didn't know he only had 18 days left, but we knew it wasn't many days left. You know, I think he knew inside he wasn't going to be around till Christmas. Um, I feel really privileged that he chose to spend as much time as he did just locked in a room with me, yeah. passing on all these gems of wisdom and provenances. Nearly the final keynote, right? Yeah, nearly the final keynote. And um, I did try and record them and the recordings didn't work. Uh, but I think that's probably a good thing because his voice had changed so much by then. Um, but I do have the furious notes that I scribbled down. Yeah. You also, from my experience of you, uh, as we say, <laughs> um, what with marriage, you remember quite a bit, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? So, and listen. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You not only listen, it's engraved and sketched into your, uh, the side of your brain, every <laughs> single detail. Um, so don't you think that you were probably the best person to produce that book? Like, and I'm saying that not to bring anyone else into the equation, but more so between you and your dad. The logical thing was to allow him to step away from it so we could yeah. see someone do it. Yeah, I think because he'd struggled so much with figuring out new ways to th- say things. I think he was appreciative of a new take and a new voice in it. And having said that, if he'd asked somebody else, it probably would have been a very different book. Yeah. Um, you know, not least of all, because the manifesto ideas, the 10 manifesto statements were an idea I came up with on a very frustrated walk. Um, and, you know, somebody else would have picked out different parts maybe to highlight than the ones that I did. Yeah. But um, there was so much there. And I remember reading and we should, we will do, we will do this. Um, I have in all of my notes from that time, just quotes that I've highlighted of being like, this is gold. You know, how do you come up with so many sentences one after the other that are just gold dust? And he did, you know, not just in his his talking, but in his writing as well. He just had such a gift for coming out with these beautiful phrases. Um, So uh, at some point, a Sir Ken Robinson book of quotes, like a three, six, five, a quote a day, Sir Ken Robinson. Um, Yeah, we have to do that because it's just... The public ones. So the ones that he did on stage, for instance, like because yeah. I can probably rattle off a number of the TED Talk ones, for instance. Yeah, yeah. Ones that maybe came from literature that he then wrote. wrote. Yeah. And then what a back of the section, like... <laughs> the ones that should <laughs> never be heard. <laughs> things that we should never... <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> no. I'm, I'm sure from my own experience, there were a number of those as well, right? Yeah. So what... What was it like, firstly, because we've talked about the Tonight Matthew reference of yeah. you'd have this star in your right. Which Americans won't get at all, but it was a show in England in the 90s, 80s, 90s. 80s, 180s. Uh, called star, Stars in Their Eyes. Stars in, yeah, Star in Your Eyes. Stars? Stars. Stars in Their Eyes. Stars in, their stars eyes. in Your Eyes. One of them. We'll Google it. Yeah. Um, where people would come on, just, just regular people come on and impersonate a celebrity a singer. And so they'd say tonight, Matthew, because the host was Matthew. Yep, Matthew. Matthew, was Matthew. Who was Matthew. <laughs> um, but they'd say tonight, Matthew, I'm going to be Cher. And then they'd sort of disappear off backstage, transform and Cher and come back through these kind of plumes of smoke and sing a Cher song. Who are um, you talking to? You just the broke the fourth wall there. I did, yeah, to, to our lovely audience. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> well, because I'm explaining it to them, not you. And, um, I know who Matthew is. Yeah, yeah but it, well, that's why I'm not telling you. You probably remember it more than I do. But anyway, so the point is, is that Dad used to say, tonight, Matthew, I'm going to be Sir Ken Robinson. And he'd disappear upstairs and come back in a plume of Armani aftershave yeah. and a tailored suit um, as Sir Ken Robinson. And there was a big joke because he physically then would look different because he wasn't in a dressing gown, you know, with stubble. <laughs> um, but the person was exactly the same. Yeah. <laughs> there was no difference in persona. So we're, we're publishing that book, right? The, the Sir Ken Robinson <laughs> Sir book. Ken at the kitchen table. But there are some amazing Ken Robinson yeah. quotes that you've, you've got and you probably have. I know we produced a book for your mum, for yeah. instance, for her birthday. Of duck poems. Of duck poems, which is a very specific reference. But we, uh, My parents were at a restaurant <laughs> in Soho in London and there, were, there was just lots of duck 
dishes on the restaurant. And so dad suddenly popped up with, don't be a duck in Soho. Don't be a duck in Soho. They'll roast your legs. They'll poach your eggs. Don't be a duck in Soho, which launched a thousand other duck poems. We had ducks all over the place where you should and should not. Anyway, so for mum's birthday, we printed it off into a, the definitive travel guide for young ducks. <laughs> yes. but, but my head's full of useless poems. I often wonder what other information I'd be able to store if it wasn't full of poems that dad said (laughs) well like i eat honey with my peas i've done it all my life it makes the peas taste funny but it keeps on my knife there we are um yeah he had all these little little phrases (laughs) (laughs) but your family in general so just specifically talking about the ken robinson side and then your family there yeah you're a ridiculously creative bunch thanks aren't you like (laughs) there's there's this kind of idea of those kinds of people and i put your dad squarely in his bracket Mm -hmm. you you look at them in awe yeah. that they're at this pedestal kind of speaking to millions of people and relating to them. And th- then you find out that some people just don't, don't walk the walk at yeah. all. They are full of hot air. Whereas <laughs> the, the Robinson clan in particular, yeah. you guys are phenomenal. Um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of it is, I'm not sure we're any more phenomenal than anybody else, but a lot of it, particularly when it comes to say, the Robinsons, so dad's immediate family, his six siblings, um, comes from circumstance as much as anything else and conditions. And I often think that they, you know, they didn't have more than one television channel. They spent a lot of time outdoors and each and every one of them has got so many hobbies and interests and, you know, they all sort of craft random things and make random things they write each other poems for birthdays and it's, it was just a way to keep each other entertained i think more than anything right. growing up in the 60s and 70s you know they didn't have any money growing up at all and they but they had each other and they were you know my uncle keith that was fifth um in line uncle keith i'm not sure how many years old he maybe 10 15 years older than my dad and all the way down to my uncle neil who was seven years younger than my dad so this big age gap of and then they had cousins, you know, so this huge sort of, but they had each other. So they kept, they kind of created their own acts and um, performances. And then that kind of carried on because, you know, that's one of the reasons mum fell in love with dad was because, you know, he was so funny and he just had her in stitches all the time. And then my brother's the same. Um, but I think it's just conditions when you grow up in a family that's kind of tickled or inspired by those things, they, they carry it on. Right. Well, we carried on with our kids. Oh yeah. We're a laugh a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, we might be one day again. <laughs> a rough few years. <laughs> a rough. Yeah, that's right. But yeah. um, it's interesting, isn't it? You look at like the Robinsons firstly, and particularly your dad's side, right? Before we then go into like what your family environment was like, because um, I know you now know, I posted a Q&A kind of thing to then see if anybody inside our community wanted to ask you certain yes. questions. And a couple have come out in particular around your way of thinking, but also your experience growing up. But I want to try and get to, and this is where we're going to get Johnny if, or Johnny revolutionary. Now, <laughs> if we get your uncle Johnny on this yeah. very soon, it would be so interesting to then understand where all that kind of come from and what it was like for him being immersed within the, the amazing Robinson family where you guys didn't have anything came literally and what, I know the saying is a stone's throw away from a certain place, but from Goodison Park in Everton, Liverpool, there was what, five, six houses that separated the football yeah. ground to then? <clears throat> to the, the house, house, yeah. In a terrace that is, well, in a very um, deprived. The, deprived. It's one of the most deprived areas of the UK. And they had each other inside yeah. how many bedrooms in that house? Two. Two bedrooms. Nine people in a two bedroom house. Yeah. yeah. And the, let's just say they're not quiet. No. I know, I know this is <laughs> my, poor, my poor grandmother. <laughs> Your poor, they're poor neighbours, if I'm honest. They're poor neighbours. Yeah. So you had all of these amazing creative beings, every single one of them we should really do an expose of actually. Just <laughs> maybe, not maybe not all of them. <laughs> yeah, maybe not all of them. We'll, get, we'll let Johnny kind of do yeah. that next. But isn't that such an interesting tale that from, from nothing, as you said, mm-hmm. they had nothing, but they had each other. Yeah. That they were able then to then find their way and outlet through creative pursuits, either mm-hmm. in music, yeah, in football, they're all musical. Mm-hmm. in art, in the arts, writing, in, in yeah. duck poems, <laughs> the prolific. What was it? What was it there? Because that Liverpool in general is just, 
a, a big beacon around that time for yeah. the scene that was there. Do you think that they were in the perfect storm? I do, and they, but they moved out of Liverpool. What didn't Johnny tell us? He was five, and he was such a nightmare. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that they had to leave Liverpool because um, he was a hoodlum and would, would run off and... Um, now he has to come on here anyway now <laughs> to explain himself. defend himself. <laughs> uh, but they moved out to Widnes. So my granddad, my dad's father, had an accident. Um, he worked on the docks and a crane dropped a piece of wood that hit him on the back of the neck. Um, and it was apparently at the, the breadth of a cigarette paper away from killing him. But it didn't kill him, it just, you know, just... Uh, paralyzed him and he was quadriplegic for 18 years. And they say that the average lifespan in the 1950s, uh, 1960s of a quadriplegic was nine years and he doubled that, you know, but so if you imagine they got some compensation from the accident, they moved out to the country to witness to a bigger house, but they still, I think there were three bedrooms for the kids. So a four bedroom house, I think Johnny, again, we'll bring Johnny on. Um, and with my, my granddad, it was probably three bedrooms because my granddad and my grandma slept in the living room in his hospital bed. And apparently he, my granddad, was the life and soul of the, the family. He was, you know, people came to see him and stayed to see him and everyone just hung out in the living room. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's no denying Liverpool. And I was just writing about this the other day. You know, dad, they got a television set in the 1960s. In 1963, the Beatles come on television in black and white and sing Love Me Do and just blow them all away. And for anybody in the world at that time, that was mind blowing. But to be live in Liverpool, you know, a contemporary of the Beatles, people your age, just down the street from it must have just been amazing. Yeah. Just incredible. Yeah. And also like the venues and stuff and all that thriving yeah, kind of scene in general. And, yeah. It's incredible. So, so maybe that they were in the perfect storm. It will be really good. As we say, this is no pressure. We're not putting this on just to then make sure that I am uncle Johnny. <laughs> but, but I yeah. think from a family historian perspective, Johnny could then really kind of paint yeah. kind of picture of that, those early days. So we went recently because unfortunately your, your uncle Neil uncle passed Neil. away. Yeah. My dad's youngest brother who, who went on to be a professional footballer at Everton football club and then Swan, well, you can tell me his football history then better than I can. <laughs> yeah. Swansea, Grimsby. Yeah. Johnny will do the rest, but he didn't play for Daryl dance, but there, another <laughs> story for another time. Um, so what I was asking. What did we, I ask we, you? we were up in Liverpool because unfortunately Uncle Neil passed away very suddenly. Yes. And so on the street that they then uh, lived was, is now a school. Yes. Which, yeah. The street they were all born on is now a school. And so Johnny, for instance, and Neil were also born in that house. Yeah. House literally in one of the bedrooms of that house. So your Uncle Neil then played for Everton, which was... Mm -hmm. ridiculously close to then that house and then opposite is now everton free school yeah which now has your dad's handprints yeah in the cement it does yeah that must feel incredible for that family well, what i find amazing about it um dad because he had polio when he was four and you know they were the generation that grew up outdoors kind of kicked out in the morning and come back for your dinner or someone on the street will feed you anyway <laughs> and um dad couldn't he had calipers on two legs like forrest gump and he couldn't keep up with everybody so he found that the best way to keep up was to be on his hands and feet. He said it was like a crab. He'd sort of just clamber along the place. Um, so for him to have his, his handprints in cement on the street where his hands literally ran him around wow. um, growing up is, I mean, he must have, I, 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 yeah, I wasn't with him when they went for that and they've moved it because the, when he saw it, they were at the back of the school on a different road. And now they're literally on the street where they lived. Um, Cause you can see it from like the house. Oh yeah. You it's could it's see a tiny little. Things. You know, it's a very small road. Yes. Yeah. yeah. What incredible. So if I can then say, firstly, your experiences of life in general are full and littered with incredible coincidences. Yeah. Loads of just various romantic stories such as that, like your dad's aversion through like experiencing polio and having that throughout his whole life. The first and only one, sorry, inside the family that then got polio. Yeah. And which is remarkable if you think that nine people inside one house. A two bedroom house. Yeah. yeah. Um, he, they believe that he got it through a speech. Well, that's, yeah, that's what's even therapist. more amazing is he had such a bad speech impediment um, at the age of four that he went to speech therapy. And so the thought that dad would even get through a sentence at the age of four, you know, with polio and, um, you know, a, a really bad speech impediment, the fact he'd go on. And there was this really spooky 
story where my nana was taking dad to speech therapy when he was probably, I don't know if it was before or after he got polio. I'm not sure if he went back to speech therapy after he got polio, but because he was the only one that went to speech therapy, the, the working theory is he got polio at the speech therapist, but how it didn't pass yeah. like wildfire. There weren't nine of them at the time. There were, because Johnny was born afterwards. So there were five kids at that point, but um, anyway, they were walking to speech therapy and a woman crossed the street and grabbed my Nana by the hand and said, your son is going to speak to millions. And it seemed so, you know, they were in, they were in Liverpool. He had a, he was four, he had a speech impediment, you know, he might have had polio at the time, but it, nothing seemed more unlikely at the time. Yeah. And then it went on, it, it, there is, and we should get Johnny on for that, the Robinson history and the this, this story, because, you know, just the, the rise throughout his life, you know, as you say, it's, and based entirely, I think on, cause there wasn't, you know, he didn't, there weren't people to open doors for him. You know, so it was all based on interest and intellect, but I also think on personality and character and on being able to be affable and, um, you know, people from any age loved him. Yeah. And still do. Yes. That's, yeah, yeah. that's incredible, isn't it? So all of those kind of romantic stories and link ups mm -hmm. of things like whoever that lady was, maybe, <laughs> maybe she needs a sweatshirt. Don't suppose she's still around. Yeah. But, um. Yeah, there was there are so many remarkable stories. I, I again, I think Johnny, for instance, and most of the Robinson family. I think we should then talk to here. But yep. from your perspective, of that must have been incredible for family parties, right? Yeah. So you you were in the UK. Mm -hmm. You would go and see your family for family functions. We won't get into the details of what happened in those <laughs> family functions because you were probably briefed. I think you were, weren't you? Not to talk <laughs> about them. At school the next day? Go on. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, but that must have been really key for your development too. Do you know, we didn't go that often. Um, we would go maybe twice a year to Liverpool. But they, yeah, they're etched, they're, the get-togethers are etched in my brain because we didn't have family. I grew up in Stratford-upon-Avon. We didn't have family close by. And then we'd go to Liverpool and there was this massive family, you know, of not just the seven siblings, but the cousins and then all of their kids that they'd had. And so I had, you know, a gaggle of cousins um, and they all still live very close together, but we didn't go, we'd, we'd maybe go twice a year, I think, to until we moved to America and then obviously much less when we moved to America. Yeah, so you moved to America when you were? 12. 12. Yes. And so that transition was seamless? <laughs> Do you know what it was for me? Um, yeah, we, I mean, we moved from the middle of a field in the Midlands in England to the west coast of California. Yeah, because <laughs> that's really seamless. Yeah. It was like, it was a glow up for me. I loved it. You know, I was, I just started high school in England, year seven. I don't really have any friends. You know, I'm, um, it's an awkward age, <laughs> 12. And I, I was never great at making friends at school necessarily. Um, not quickly anyway. So I didn't have a, a close set of friends that I was devastated to leave. Um, and suddenly we're rollerblading along the Venice boardwalk you know, for a three month summer vacation. And I, I, yeah, I loved it. Um, my brother had a more difficult transition because he did have friends and he did have a girlfriend and he was 16, you know, so that was a, a more of an upheaval, but he's still in California. So Sarah, isn't it? Yeah. Is <laughs> Dad didn't know when he told that story in the Ted talk that they were going to put it online and he used her real name and he lived in fear of a knock on the door. <laughs> <laughs> this girl showing up being like, you ruined my life. I'm Sarah. <laughs> And 75 million people know I was dumped. Yeah, <laughs> by your son, because of you. <laughs> yes, Sarah. Yeah, I've been on the scene a week or so. <laughs> right, okay. But that is, as he says, that's like a long-term oh. commitment a week. Yeah. So I know that was really hard for your brother at that time, but for you, that was a good time to then do that. Yes. So 12 years old, where you could transition really nicely from a UK field with nothing in there but your fairies, <laughs> yeah. which you then bring along to then the yeah. US. Did you bring along your fairies? No, I left them in the garden. Okay. So were you a different person, do you feel, from UK version of you to US version of you very quickly? It's hard to tell because yes, is the short answer, but let me expand upon that. Please, please <laughs> um, it's hard to tell because I think around 12, 13, you shift anyway in your life, don't you? But I... My, when I think my childhood is in two distinct parts, there's England up until 12 and then there's America from 12 to 22. And I was really innocent in England. You know, we lived in a field in 
we used to shut the front gates and, and not really see that many people. It was the four of us in the house. Um, my parents worked a lot and my brother was four years older than me. And I spent quite a lot of time. We were all very, very, very close, but I spent a lot of time on my own as well, playing with the fairies in the garden and my doll's house and my dolls and my stuffed animals. And I think I had, I was outside a lot. Um, we, we didn't watch that much television. We only had, we didn't get the fifth channel until 1997, <laughs> which was what, four years before we moved. It was very exciting. Um, but so my first half of my childhood was really sheltered in a nice way. It was very wild and free and running barefoot in the garden and talking to the fairies. Um, the second half was sort of golden sunshine. So if the first half was green leaves and foliage, the second half was golden sunshine and sand. Yeah. Um, and suddenly we went from seven channels to cable network and cartoon network and a swimming pool in the garden and, um, you know, and teenage them. So, yeah, I think the first half was introverted. The second half was probably extroverted. Interesting. So which one are you? Both. I think I'm more introverted than I am extroverted. Dad was as well. I, you know, I can be extroverted for periods of time and then collapse <laughs> <laughs> and uh, shut the blinds and go to bed at 7.30. And totally verify Like that. I did last night. <laughs> uh, absolutely right. Just gone. Where's Kate? Oh, she's. You like that though. You oh, you totally. can be extroverted, but your your default is. I need a break from this afterwards. Uh, no, I know. Five hours. We'll five see hour you tomorrow. Break. No one talks to me. No one talks to me at all. I'm too sociable. That's my that's my quota for the year. Is just yeah. this conversation with my wife. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm privileged. That's right. So you do you feel like you battled that, or is that just no. something that you've kind of just learned? No, I don't think I battled it. I think I was at a good age for it to happen. But it was, it was a, from our perspective, it was exciting. I don't know if I'd moved from California to a field in England at 12, if it would have been the same excitement. You know, suddenly yeah. you're moving to where the movies happen and where it's sunny all year round. And, you know, um, so it, it was so exciting at the time. And my parents were so excited. You know, no, there was just an energy of, of euphoria in it. We were really sad to move. And that, I think that had a profound effect saying goodbye to people and not so much friends, but family. Um, that at some point I'm sure I'll dive into <laughs> with a seasoned professional, but <laughs> um, no, it was, it was so, it was just so exciting. That's amazing. What was that feeling? Was it built up when you, because it wasn't spontaneous. It wasn't as spontaneous as me asking that question there. <laughs> no. Right. So, because I, I wanted to kind of paint a picture firstly for everybody that the creative environment that you've kind of, you got used to and your family values, I suppose, are informed by this amazing mix of people inside the Robinson clan and also mm. on your mum's side as well, which we should also then get to at some point. Another um, very musical creative family. Indeed. And, so you've had all of that this, this within you. Mm -hmm. And then because of what your parents are then doing, because they were on a mission, weren't they, both of them together? Yeah. That wasn't just someone calls you up and says, I got you a house in LA. Your dad had been traveling a I long mean, time. Ultimately, that's here. exactly what it was. <laughs> someone called the house and said, do you want to move to LA? <laughs> um, no, he'd been working with the Getty Center for a while. And um, he, he'd spent six weeks there one summer. And I, <laughs> we were in Mallorca, me, my mum, and my brother, and dad flew to meet us in Mallorca from LA. And we were so excited. We hadn't seen him for six weeks. We were so excited to see him. But he'd discovered Polly Pies, which was a diner on Wilshire Boulevard in LA in Santa Monica. Um, and he had eaten there unrestrictedly <laughs> for six weeks. And I didn't recognize him. I hid behind my mum when he showed up um, because he'd transformed so much. So anyway, he'd spent a lot of time in America. Transformed. Transformed. Um, polite way of saying he went like Eddie Murphy and Nutty Professor. He did, yeah. He'd, put, he'd, he'd grown, shall I say. Right. Um, he was still the same person, but it was, you know, when you were, <laughs> what was I, I must have been, well, uh, to be fair, I, Mallorca, I don't think I was much older than eight and we didn't move to America till I was 12. Okay. So that is a long time building relationship. But yeah, no, it's, we'd, my parents had, um, we'd been out to LA one summer and, you know, it had been a thing for a while, but then one day the phone rang and it was, do you want to move to America? And the, the story dad always told was, and I remember the evening, it was a January evening in England. So miserable. And mum had just made a stir fry, which was like the new trendy thing. They just got a walk and they sort of made a stir fry a lot. Um, 
And the phone rang as dinner was going on the table. Mum said, whoever it is, tell them you'll call them back. And so dad went and came back. And mum said, who was it? And dad said, it was Jack Miles from the Getty. He um, asked if we'd like to move to California. And mum's like, well, what did you say? And he said, I, I said, I'd call him back. <laughs> we can tofu hit the ceiling. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, so it, it, it was a long time in the making. Do you think it was the making? Yeah, definitely. How did your life change? I mean, there wasn't a way it didn't change, really. You know, we, as I say, we went from being the four of us behind closed doors in a field to when we got to America, my parents were suddenly kind of the bright new things on the social scene. And my brother was old enough to babysit. So they went out a lot and we stayed home a lot and ordered pizza and swam um, and watched Cartoon Network and the Disney Channel. I'm not complaining. It was great. <laughs> There's a lot of story about TV here, which is awesome. <laughs> in my teen years, yeah. Um, I, you know, I think for me, the biggest lesson it gave me is that you can live anywhere in the world. I think it came along for me at an age where it opened the whole world up. And if I could move to America at 12 from England, you know, I, I feel now I could live anywhere. Um, which is, I think, one of the best lessons you can give your kids, the world, essentially. Yeah. You know. The making of you, firstly, yeah. but then also the partnership that your mum and dad had and then of your dad. Yeah, I mean, they'd, the reason and people always say, you know, think the TED talk was the start of dad's career and you don't get asked to do a TED talk unless you've got a career worth speaking about and you don't get asked to move to America unless you've, you know, made waves in your sector. Yeah. The Getty doesn't move you out, just move as anybody out. So his, you know, his career was significant um, even before we moved to America, but yeah, it put him on a global platform and certainly the TED talk, which was what we, we moved in 2001. He got knighted in 2003. Ted Talk 2006. It all happened quite quickly. Yeah. Um, and then he got, he got the knighthood whilst he was working at the Getty, right? Yes. Which was another cross pond conversation. Like he didn't know that that was going to happen no. at all. No, no, he didn't. He just, he, they, he just got a call saying that he's been. Hello, he, it's the queen. <laughs> presumably not the queen, <laughs> but um, no, he got a call one day saying that, you know, don't tell anybody, but your name's going to be in the Queen's honours list as a Knight's Bachelor. And they couldn't tell anybody for months. So, and then I remember the day that the list came out, the Queen's birthday in June, it was the day I, day I graduated middle school, my one and only school graduation. Um, and we couldn't find him on the list. And he called us into the room and we were like, what are we doing? I thought they were going to say they were having another baby. I was devastated at the news. You know, my parents were in their fifties at this point, so I should have known better. Um, I don't really know what a Knight's Bachelor was, but he couldn't find his name anywhere on the list. And somebody called and said, um, ah, Sir Ken. And he was like, where have you seen it? Where have you seen it? And it was on the British people living overseas list. But I will never forget the color his face went when he built this up and he wasn't on the list. You can just imagine the kind of panic that for months he'd been yeah. sitting on this news and suddenly maybe he got it wrong. Did you not get told before? No, not before, the, not before it was announced. So no. you definitely thought it was a baby? I definitely thought, oh, I hoped it was a baby, yeah. You hoped, it was, you were right. You, like, you're still a little bit angry about that. <laughs> no, oh, yeah, you know, knighthood's great and all, but would have liked a sister. <laughs> That's funny. So, yeah. so it was just your dad and your mum keeping a secret yeah. for how long? I don't know, weeks. Weeks? Yeah. And then... He reveals all to you guys yeah. and condoles you and says, don't worry about the <laughs> no baby. Don't be yeah. silly. And weeks of that building, he can't find his name in the list. Yeah. I can't imagine how white your it, dad went. No, it was red. It was the color of this. It just went like, <laughs> just <laughs> as in embarrassed, embarrassed, sort of just, yeah, his, he went scarlet, <laughs> the color. And then the pure relief when, when the friend called to say. Incredible. What was that feeling in that room? Oh, do you know, I would love to say something beautiful and profound, but me and my brother were teenagers. Okay. You know, I was 14. I didn't really know what a Knight's Bachelor was. Um, the significance grew on me. I'm sure, I'm sure we did that kind of classic teenage thing. Oh, cool. Well done. And <laughs> went back to the computer. Um, but for them, they, you know, my mum wore a tiara out for dinner for weeks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she genuinely did. <laughs> Jeans, white t-shirt and a crown. Um, <laughs> but for dad, you know, for him to call his mum, you know, who was still alive at the time and to have come from that house we talked about that, you know, two bedroom house on Speller Lane in, in Liverpool to call and say, you know, I'm going to be knighted and to take her to the palace as well, you know, for the knighthood. Just, 
just must have been for everybody, you know, for his mum as well, but for the pride that he had in being able to make that phone call. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, dad, he did everything for everybody else. So to yeah. be able to make mum a lady, yeah. you know, was... And Sir Ken Robinson became the brand, you know, it was before we sort of knew about brands. Um, but people would think his name was Sir Ken, you know, like one, one word. Because if you say Ken Robinson, a lot of people miss it. But if you say Sir Ken Robinson, um, it clicks. Yeah. You know, it became such a part. Not that he was, you know, pretentious about it at all. It just became such a part of the persona. It, it's been easier from my side, for instance, of I, I I marketed previously your dad's face, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And to me at that time, I wasn't marketing your dad's face. I was marketing Sir Ken Robinson. Yeah. And so knowing Sir Ken Robinson and then knowing Ken Robinson, not distinctly different in any way, but they are. But you can put them in different buckets, right? Right. And so I feel like I, that became quite natural for you guys, that yeah. Ken Robinson was, again, that, stubble person in at the breakfast yeah. table still making ridiculously amazing insightful jokes and poems and being must be incredible what a, an amazing philosopher philosophical mind right? mm -hmm. then being able to then stars in your eyes turn it on and be sir kim robinson yeah. must have been really interesting to then see as he then grew into the knighthood role you know i associate ken robinson with fluffy cashmere jumpers and endless cups of tea um and i associate sir ken robinson with black suits and suitcases and armani aftershave yeah um and equally proud of both you know it was from my perspective amazing to get to travel with him as much as i did you know we did oklahoma and helsinki australia all over the place and to just sort of tag along for that was incredible but you know i'm not sure that was any better than sitting at the breakfast table with him for four hours just chatting you know that was um he had this unique ability to make just everything feel special and that wasn't a sir ken robinson thing that was a him thing were you there when we in february 2020 we my parents sold the house and we, they moved back to England. And so we were, we were there with Adeline in February 2020. But I think you might have gone back to London. But we had an evening sitting at the table. I think it was mum, dad, me and my best friend, Julie, um, sorting the random coins that we found in the house. <laughs> no. You weren't there. I wasn't there. No. But it was probably the most fun night I've had. <laughs> no, no offense to you. <laughs> We've had some brilliant nights. But I mean, <laughs> of an evening, it was just so much fun. However we were doing it, just sorting the coins. And it's such a boring job. But because he, oh, he just had a moment where every single day was yeah. special or fun or funny. He had, he had an ability to see the funniness in everything. Um, to the point where I, I remember saying to him, you know, not everything has to be a joke. <laughs> <laughs> some things you should probably take a bit more seriously well, than you do. I'm but sure. thank God he didn't. I'm you know? sure you weren't the first person to say that. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, and we have on record in the archive his uh, correspondence with his accountant, right? And I'm sure they probably yes. said that as well. At the time. <laughs> yeah. You have no money, start taking this more seriously. <laughs> but, but there is, I guess, a separation there that people don't kind of know because I mean, my experience of then Sir Ken Robinson was really the first bit, of course it would be, whereas I think the power that kind of came through yeah. that that authenticity of who that person is was very much informed all the way through his life you can you can kind of just stretch yeah. out and see exactly how he was then kind of formed and how he was relentless in doing what he then set out to then do and achieve do you know and it's something that we've done so i'm kate robinson professionally but kate dunn because we're married yeah. um at home and I, that came from I don't, I don't even know if it did come from dad, but it came from Jackie Cooper, who's a really good friend and um, is the head of brand for Edelman. I think chief brand officer. Chief brand officer for, for Edelman. Um, but I remember after Adeline was born, you know, really struggling with, and I, I don't, you know, I've spoken to many people who've had babies, women who've had babies, and how do you have an identity after you've had a baby? How do you go back to work? And she said that, you know, she has her maiden name at home and slippers and she puts on heels and goes to work as Jackie Cooper. Mm. 
uh, which is her maiden name. So she has a married name at home and her maiden name for work. And it just seemed to make sense at the time. And it still makes sense. You know, I put on the lipstick and go to work as Kate Robinson and come home and <laughs> <or you>. sleep. <laughs> and sleep as Kate Dunn. <laughs> One into that. <laughs> That's right. That but the, the two, yeah, I don't know if that's, you know, I'm sure there are some psychiatrists out there who would have a field day with that separation of identity. But it actually, I, you know, it, it worked. We can, I can talk about SKR, you know, Sir Ken Robinson till the cows come home. But if we start talking too much about Ken Robinson, I'm a mess, you know, I'm yeah. a puddle on the floor. Yeah. I, th- I think that's, I'd be interested to see because I don't want to get into it just yet of your writing a new book. Yes. Um, but there are parallels there with what you've just said, which need to probably be explored a bit more around now that we live in a third world. Mm-hmm. Would you like to quickly just do the premise and then I'll get back to the line of questioning. Sure. Uh, yeah, so the new book, well, I'm hoping I'm writing a, yeah, a new book at the moment. The, um, the idea behind it being that in, imagine if we talk about how we don't just live in one world, we live in two, everybody. There's the world within you of your own thoughts and personal emotions that's private to you. It exists only because you exist. And then there is the world around you, which is the physical world that we all share that is, happens, you know, no matter how highly you think of yourself, it's there regardless of whether or not you're in it. Um, and the two are so intimately connected because you, you form a sense of identity based as much on the world around you as you do the world within you. It's formed by your experiences of the world and how you view the world is through the lens of who you are on the inside. Um, but the book is making the case that for the first time in our evolution as a species, the generations now Gen Alpha and Gen Z a coming of age and forming their inner identity through a third world, you know, the virtual world. And now for the first time ever, we all exist, not just within two worlds, but within three worlds. And so the book is looking at the impact on that for society and for our young people and for the parents and carers and educators who lead and take care of them. Um, Cause so many adults say, you know, Oh God, I don't understand social media or my kids on TikTok for, however many hours a day, but I have no idea what they're doing on there. And actually what they're doing on there is they're not just watching videos and making videos and liking posts and commenting. They're forming a sense of self, you know, a sense of identity. Um, they're finding affiliation, people with like-minded views. They're forming political beliefs, religious beliefs, and they're doing it in this environment that no generation has done it in before. So, Do you think that that's, or do you think that you could draw parallels and comparisons to your experience of being Kate Dunn, Kate Robinson, and your dad being Ken Robinson and Sir Ken Robinson in a way. Through the book? Yeah. Or is that with, just a- <laughs> Within that premise. Well, I just think that without being flippant, and obviously, again, you're just writing it, so I don't want to kind of like <laughs> throw in an extra chapter or three, but have you considered? But that's, that's a unique position that I think you've just speculated that a lot of people may or may not have that they have two separations between who are who are they personally yeah. and who are they portraying I think, yeah we all, so, we all do i mean you know on social media you have multiple personalities you, that's that sort of meme going around of who you a picture of dolly parton representing who you are on facebook versus instagram versus tiktok versus linkedin we all have this very professional persona where we are delighted and privileged and honored by everything we do on linkedin you know and then there's the version of us on TikTok, I'm not on TikTok really, but which is, you know, a bit more social and raunchy. And then there's a Facebook one, which is very family appropriate. Um, and that's, that's another facet of it, you know, then the multi, the, not the multiverse, the metaverse, but it is also the multi, the multiverse of the metaverse. It's not just one persona kids are creating, it's multiple. And, and that's, you know, you need multiple personas. You need to know, speaking to Jenny from the block here, but you need to know the, um, how to relate to different types of people in the world. You know, it's one of the, things that we should be learning. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the reference there of Jenny in the block is <laughs> a slight diss on me, isn't it? That I... I depends how you take it. I Diss. <laughs> um, that I can hold conversation with um, the affluent people of this world. I yeah. can meet King Charles, for instance, yeah. and he can bumble and mumble at me like yeah. he did. And... We can you be can hold a civilised, very posh conversation with but them. But as soon as then someone who may... Paint decorator walks in. Or may have been someone that I used to like rub shoulders with a long time ago, I, I turned into a bit of like Jack the Lad. Jenny from the block. You're still Jenny from the block. <laughs> you, you used to have a little, still don't have a thing. Um, okay. Thank you very much for that little no, thing. You're but welcome. all on but you. See, but that's two that. personalities, right? Right there. That's absolutely you have, right. You have to be able to adapt to different different types of situations and people. So do you think that you've developed that yourself naturally, or do you feel like you've been inspired having a father who would then come down, stars in your eyes, smoke, 
appearing at the breakfast table and be like, I smell amazing. I am Sir Ken Robinson. Do not get up. Which he always used to say to me. Yeah. Not or not the smelling amazing. But no, no, he wouldn't say I smell amazing. Walk in a room and say, don't get up. He did smell amazing. He did smell amazing. Um, the... Yes and no. I think, you know, I was lucky enough to grow up with a family and, and even before the knighthood, you know, dad was on the board of the Royal Ballet, the Birmingham Royal Ballet, and we used to go to the green room and, you know, I would go for a dinner afterwards with the chairman of the Birmingham Royal Ballet and steal his potatoes, you know, from, from his plate as a kid. But I was lucky enough to travel with my parents and meet people from all walks of life and as there's no better experience than that in terms of being able to adapt to different people. Um, but I also got a masterclass in people skills, certainly from dad, who was so just genuinely interested in people oh. and, you know, trying to, you know, trying to stop him at a book signing was impossible because he just wanted to know everybody's story and he'd remember it. You know, even after his, he had a Whipple procedure in May, 2020. And I called, <laughs> I called him that evening or he called me from the ICU that evening, the intensive care unit having just had a nine hour surgery with most of his insides removed. And he started telling me about the anaesthetist's daughter and what she's studying at university. <laughs> you know, she's like, why were you, why did you ask? <laughs> You're about to under, you know, literally on a gurney um, and how you remember it after all the anesthesia. But he was just so interested in people. You, you should know. have tried picking him up from the hospital. <laughs> I couldn't get away. It took me ages not to get him in the car. That was the quickest bit. Me and Johnny did it, but it was all the other people saying goodbye. It was like this yeah. just stretch, just people just it was so felt lovely. seen yeah. by him, I guess. You know, and that didn't matter if it was a CEO or a doorman or, you know, the taxi driver. It was just, we've taken cars in America that dad used to take and they, they figured out that, you know, we were related and suddenly they're just gushing about how he was just so, and it wasn't an affectation. He was just, and that comes from his background, you know, yeah. from his parents and family, but also never forgetting where he came from and being really interested in who people were yeah, and their stories and how they got there. Do you find that you have a lot of similarities? No, I don't really care about people. <laughs> You can't do that. See, <laughs> that's one similarity there. Taking yeah. that joke and making it. Um, I, I hope we, I'm sure, you know, I hope we have many similarities, but I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't overstate them either. You know, I obviously very similar passions, um, but he, you know, he had skill sets that were just remarkable, you know, and um, I think in part of this, I think, you know, we've talked about this before when someone dies, I think you do, you know, a little bit of them goes into you anyway. And so there are things like mum never used to really drink tea. Dad drank it by the gallon. And now she drinks so much tea. You're eating Marmite. You know, we haven't got you an HP sauce yet, but you're eating Marmite. And um, then, so there are bits that I just, you know, experiences in particular with what we're doing now, where I just want to tell him. But then you sort of feel like you don't have to because you hope he's there anyway. Yeah. Still somehow, it's a very odd, there's a whole... I mean, there are several podcasts about grief, but it's a very odd, horrible part of life, losing somebody. Anyway, well, in, in answer to your question, <laughs> I hope, I hope that we have a lot of similarities. Um, but I also, you know, I also have to figure out who I am in and amongst all of this. Where are you different then? Um, he was a lot more patient than I am. <laughs> He was endlessly patient. Oh, he did live with me. <laughs> no, he was endlessly patient. He didn't need anywhere near as much sleep. He was, you know, we had this on his, the, the I was going to say brochure, but it's not a brochure at a funeral, is it? The little book thing that you, at the back it said eternally curious. Because uh, he was, you know, he was sort of forensically curious about absolutely everything. Yeah. And. Um, Imagine YouTube was made for him. Oh, the hours. The hours. He's, that's why the manifesto never got written. No. <laughs> The hours on YouTube, you know. Just watching himself on the TED Talk. <laughs> Presumably re-watching things like The Beatles and, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, he, and I'm not saying that I'm not curious, but that kind of ferocious level of, of curiosity. Um, I'd imagine you have, you have. You're more like that. I'd imagine you have different things going on in your lives. At various points, probably your dad didn't think he was eternally curious and probably didn't feel it. <laughs> 
I mean, certainly we know of stories that won't ever make the light of day, but yeah, the eternally curious was one side, but also that kind of ferocious step into like getting on and doing it. Yeah. You're, you're incredibly intent on ensuring that things get done, get done extremely well. I am a sprinter, not a marathon runner. Right. I think dad was a marathon runner. So you Usain Bolt. Yeah, true. I think dad was better at marathons. I am better at um, sprinting, at putting a lot of energy into a project for a short amount of time and then Sleeping. Sleeping. <laughs> Sleeping for long periods of time. That's, that's just the way that you work, right? But, you know, getting to know that has been really, we were talking about this the other day, it's really important to figure out how you work. Um, I'm not a nine to fiver. You know, I, I don't do well chained to a desk. I am much better at short bursts or, um, yeah, inspired, sort of working when inspiration strikes. I'm not great at the low dopamine level things yeah um doesn't mean i can't do them i just try very hard not to do them were you like taking a deadline ripping up that deadline and then creating panic or urgency around small micro tasks right yeah i mean like the driving test my my driving theory test i started studying the night before the test but it, but it, but then you know, I promptly forgot everything in it. <laughs> oh, totally. So how um, was school when you were growing up? Did you do that at school? Yes. No, or I just like study the day before and then just? No, no. In school, I just didn't study. I um and and failed the tests. I found my when we were going through the archive, I found all of my report cards, and they were damning. You Can know. we please publish some of them? No, no, no. They were mortifying. You know, it really, it was things. You know. Kate needs to learn to show up to class. Kate needs to do her homework. You know, Kate looks bored. And then there were lots of things like, you know, Kate's contributing really well and seems very interested in the topic, but just doesn't turn in the homework. No one hasn't studied for the test. And I just... Um, what year was this? I left school in 2006 when I was 16. So it was the early 2000s. So, and your dad's TED talk was in March 2006? Yeah, and I left school in March 2006. Right, so he um, gets off the stage and he's like... <laughs> We're going. No, it was not quite like that. I had I got mono or glandular fever and took a month off school because I was so sick and then started getting text messages like you're going to fail the 11th grade. And, um, not being sick. Fa- yeah, you know, get back here. And I, so I went back when I was just still so sick. If anyone's had, you had glandular fever. If anyone else has had it, it's horrible. Um, but I hadn't read The Great Gatsby which was English was the first class back and I hadn't read it. And there was a pop quiz and I just went up and said, I haven't read it. And I got kicked out of class at seven. What time school? So eight 30 in the morning in America. Um, so I did what any responsible independent 16 year old would do. And I went and cried in the bathroom and called my mum. There you go. And actually she took me out of school. Um, when I was 16, not out of, it took me out of that school when I was 16. And then there was much bigger conversations about what would come next. You know, I, I think by anyone else's standard, I let myself down at school. Um, but I, it's, I have a very hard time making myself do something if I'm not interested in it. And I have a really, we know this, right. I have a really hard time playing by other, I'm not particularly rebellious at all, but I have a very hard time playing by other people's rules. Yep. Um, and being told what to do and when to do it. And it, you know, a hormonal teenager version of that was, it did, I think, I think I silent quit would be the term now. I did a lot of silent quitting in school <laughs> until we just quit. <laughs> In 2006, March. Yeah, March 2006. Isn't that such an interesting time that yeah. you told that you do this, your dad does this TED talk, you were in bed. Yes and no, because, you know, so you don't get asked to do a TED talk unless you've got something to talk about. So it wasn't like the first time dad had talked about this stuff. Um, and they didn't know when he did the TED talk that it was going to be put online. So, you know, he knew it was a big conference, but it was, it was also another conference that he was doing. Right. Um. Yeah. And meanwhile, you know, and there were, there were other factors. My Nana had died the year before the Ted talk. So dad, the Ted talk was a year and a month after she had died. And it was what, you know, you got, we know that cause we've been living through one recently. You go through these periods in life where you're just sort of rapid transition. Yeah. You know, you kind of have a two year stint where it's just like, you've kind of gone into a time warp of transition. And then there are periods of time where nothing really happens or nothing really changes that much. Yeah. Which I can't wait for, by the way, <laughs> roll on that time. Um, but yeah, the, the 2006, right. It was one of those, my parents always talked about wormholes in space, you know, making the impossible happen. Mm. And that was one of those wormhole 
moments 2006 for us. Yeah, specifically that month as well. Yeah. That's incredible that for everyone else at that time, it was just your dad doing another conference. And for everyone else, yeah, you were at that time at the end of your tether as a family supporting you through school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they unschooled you. Yeah, we unschooled. But then all of a sudden from that moment on, not only does your dad's world online start happening and people think he should wear a different shirt, or that was your mum's story, <laughs> but that starts then gaining traction. Just one talk, I mean, not Just, his work. Yeah, but not that quickly, right? Because he did the TED talk in 2006 in March, but I don't think, I don't know that they put it online for at least six months after that. That's interesting. And then it took about a year for the traction to pick up on it. And it was around 2007, 2008 that people started crossing the room at dinner table, you know, at restaurants to talk to him. Or I remember being at the Apple store in Century City in LA and the person who worked there, you know, like this kid was sort of shaking coming up to talk to him. And from our perspective, you know, I was probably 18 by this point, 18, 19. I wasn't living at home anymore. And um, so we'd meet for dinner and things. And that was just bizarre and hilarious. And he was so lovely, you know, but it, was, it wasn't like we'd grown up with a famous dad or an actor you know, who people were always crossing forever, from any age. That was, it was such a novelty for, for him and for us. It was just great. You know, and, and what a nice person for it to happen to. Yeah. You know. So from, because you're by, I don't want to say directly, but you have similarity with the girl in that story of the TED Talk. Julian, Julian then, yes. So uh, you could really identify and probably... I think like a lot of people. I mean, would sorry. you then say that your dad was channeling a lot there in terms of his experience of watching you? Because he didn't, you didn't see your school reports. No, I never saw my school reports. He, he, so he was he feeling was, that for you. Yeah, he took them and kept them. <laughs> he didn't burn them, he kept them. <laughs> for you to sift through the archive. <laughs> to sift through long after he died. But no, I didn't. Um, he didn't share them with me at the time. Or if he did, I... I can't remember. Um, Why do you think that was? You know, he was a fixer. He, he wanted, you know, he did things like when I was 18 and I started working, he registered me for US tax and never told me. <laughs> it wasn't until we packed up the house in February 2020, he said, by the way, here's all your tax statements from the past 10 years. I was like, what? <laughs> Didn't know I've been paying tax for the past 10 years, which is really lovely of dad, but also not particularly helpful. Um, and that's a lesson I think when it comes to us raising our kids, it's probably one of the few things I do differently would be is how you do your taxes. Yeah. Um, but he, you know, he just wanted, I think the biggest joy he had in life was working hard so other people didn't have to, so the people he loved could just have a nice time. Um, it comes from, (laughs) it came from a very good place, but, um, what was the question? I got all distracted there by how nice he was. <laughs> <laughs> Do you find that happens a lot? Yeah. Yeah. No, he was, you know, it's one of those, for us, one of those sort of unimaginable losses. I think losing a parent for anybody, even if they have a complicated relationship with their parent, is one of those big life, horrible things to go through. But for him, for us, when it was him, it was like, you know, our whole world went down with him. So that process over the past two years of, just figuring out what the world looks like without him in it. And he's still in it, right? You know, we're still doing this and, um, and his work and message is so important. You know, I think as much, if not more so than ever before, but I, you know, I think it was time. I, you know, I think there could have been less extreme ways for this to happen, but I, I think he'd, he'd done everything he needed to do. And there's, there's a comfort in that. Yeah. Well, and it was also, it's a challenge for us, isn't it? And everybody else. Yeah. That, He's paved the way for a lot of people, yourself included. Yes. And also me. Yeah. So and the challenge, I guess, and is... all the creative revolutionaries. Yeah, is how do we all get together? So I guess before I, I've asked, as I said before, yeah. I've asked a number of creative revolutionaries You're for the question. Okay. And they might, some I've kind of listed in, but I'll ask some directly, but specifically on the creative revolution, if I may. Yes. The... The platform's inspired by your dad. Yeah. Talk to me about his aspiration for, um, you don't have to then paint the picture of where he was when he had this epiphany of um, what he wanted to then do. He would tell me off for tapping the table while we're recording. I know, but it's not related to the microphones. Okay. You sure? I can edit it out. Okay. I'm just saying you'd tell me off. 
How do I edit that to then seamlessly cut? Right, stay, stay exactly where you are. <laughs> Stop tapping the table. Well, now I'm going to be like, where's the cut? Where's the natural cut? There's I'm no natural, natural cut. cut. Everyone knows cut. that you broke your own rule. Everyone knows your name, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> That's uh, a really important point where people are trying to find out a bit more about the Crazy Revolution. Go on, the Crazy Revolution. So well, they don't want to hear banging. Yeah. Sorry? Go on. For several years, your dad had a vision for this platform. Yeah. Right. And so we we began working with him when 2016. Yes. Because, so, oh, we haven't really got. Why have I not asked you about like the main points in your life? Like, what's the best moment in Singapore, for instance? Like, what changed your life forever? <laughs> in Singapore specifically. Like, who's the best person you've ever met? Buy it. And I'm joking. Um, but we started working with your dad in 2016, didn't we? Yeah. In the most incredible way. Yes. Well, for me anyway, I thought it was awesome. I went to Cannes Lions because your dad was there. Yeah. So, oh, went to Cannes 2016. Your dad was speaking because he was involved with a project called Dirt is Good. Yep. And it was I don't a, know why I said it in such a funny, funny um, journey. <laughs> There's more of a question inflection. It was it was the real play coalition. Right. Which is still exists it still goes on. It's things like Lego and IKEA and um other very cool organizations and Unilever at the time talking about the importance of free play, free unstructured play, and dab chaired the white paper that they wrote as a result. So yes, you went to Cannes for that. So he went to Cannes and he spoke there on behalf of and with Unilever and these brands. Yep. Meanwhile, we met in... Ran around can. We, we met in 2015. <laughs> yeah, in Singapore. In Singapore, where I told you to like, get out of my way. Yeah. In a nicer way, look at us now, it's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, is that that game we were playing? <laughs> the, so we meet in 2015. 2016, unbeknownst to everybody, like Can Lions was organised by the same organisation I worked for. Yeah. Your dad asks us to then jump with him. So you were working with 100. I was working with 100. Yep. You were working with Bet. Indeed. And the idea was that I think he knew that his mobility was getting worse and he was getting older and, you know, the, the structure had always just been him, you know, and, and mum and the, you know, his agents and that, but it, it all depended on him getting on planes and going and talking to people. And so we came on to devise a structure that would go, you know, we called it Project Legacy even back then. Yeah. And dad asked that we not do that because it sounded like Project In Memoriam. <laughs> I totally forgot we called yeah, it. Yeah, we always called it Project Legacy. The idea was how do you extend his reach that in a way that isn't dependent upon him. And so we came up with, at the time, it was called Pocket, wasn't it? It was yeah. sort of so Ken in your pocket. The idea was that it would, a website where people could come and access his thoughts and his recommendations and, and him, really. Um, and he got so excited about that and he used to have an exercise bike and he was like, I was on the exercise bike and I can, you know, I suddenly thought we can get people connecting with each other and collaborating and anyway, so that it had various iterations, but this is what the creative revolution is. Yeah. I'd love to have seen him with it. Yeah. would have been great. I know obviously the technology that we've then got for the creative revolution is probably night and day from what we could have then produced at that time. Yeah. Yeah. And we were talking about apps and things, which we will have a mobile version of the creative revolution, but it was going to be specifically app based, wasn't it? It wasn't. Yeah. Um, yeah, he did, I, I think he'd, I think he'd really love it. Why? Um, because it is everything he said. It's people can connect, they can collaborate, they have access to his thoughts. Um, and it's about the community, which, you know, he was the grassroots revolution. It is, it's the reason we don't have corporate sponsorship. It is the grassroots revolution that's you know transforming the world and that's what he campaigned for you know and it's he was so he loved like we said he loved people so much and i think he would just love every member of this community you know i i I wish so much that he was here so that he could come and talk to everybody but i just you know knowing that people are actually doing you know dedicating their lives and their careers to being the change. You know, yeah. not, not necessarily inspired by him, but just, just for the belief in the creative revolution that we all talk about and care about so passionately. I think you're absolutely right. I can imagine that with the tool that we have where we send our welcome messages, for instance, yeah. I think he'd have been thrilled to do every single one. I think yeah. there is probably a length or a limit to how long the message could be. And I think he'd probably- <laughs> Speaking of which, you've got to ask me the, the community questions. I will do. I have a number of questions. Yeah. Um, I'm going to pull out, firstly, uh, we'll just, I'll do it in order, which is also okay. really good. I'm ready. Well, because funnily enough, Susan's 
been in touch, Susan yep. Hilliard. And well, Susan knew your dad from way back when. She so did. what's really interesting here are two As questions. Teenagers. That she asks. Yep. Um so the first one is uh, did you find a big difference between the British education you received and the USA education you experienced when yes. you moved to Los Angeles? Could you explain? Yes. Um, and I should caveat this by saying that I went to private schools in both England and America, which is important because the system is different in both, but also I wasn't specifically within the system. Um, but in England, I went to a prep school. It was the way they mostly are in England. It was Church of England. You know, we sat cross-legged on the floor and sang hymns at assembly. Um, I mentioned that because the first day at assembly in my American school, we walked into the gym, sat on bleachers. There was M&M blasting and the assembly was run by the students, by the prefects. So it was like, you know, we weren't wearing uniforms anymore. <laughs> um, it was just, it was like walking into an American movie, you know, with the football players and the cheerleaders and the red cups at parties. Um, but, you know, I did four years in America of American history and nothing else from a history perspective. You know, in England, we did things like Latin um, and other, you know, world history, I suppose, which I think there is a focus on American history in American schools, which makes sense. Um, but I, you know, I, it, it mine's such a story of privilege. It was an elite experience on both sides of the pond. So, um, but I think the scale is so different. You know, I have friends who went to state schools in America, or public schools in America, um, you know, and there are 600 kids to every grade, whereas the schools I went to are much smaller and um, elite is the only word I can say for all of it. For both. Yes, for both my American experience and my English experience. But also it's a difference. It would be different, right? There's a difference between primary school and secondary school. And there was such a, I, I said I did six months of high school in England, year seven, but I went into seventh grade in America because the way the system works. So I started middle school in America. Mm. Um, my brother got hit hardest because he did his GCSEs and we flew the day after his last GCSE to America. And then he got to America and his GCSEs meant nothing. He aced them by all accounts, but they meant nothing. He still had to do math. He still had to sit the SATs. Um, I moved to America before the GCSEs. I left school before, you know, before the SATs. So I have um, dodged, <laughs> you know, I have cousins who did, there's so many exams. There are a lot more exams in England, you know, they're right the way through. And I have cousins who then graduated in England and went on to become accountants. And I felt like we're still doing exams right through their twenties. Um, whereas I had the exact opposite experience. I kind of dodged <laughs> exam bullets left, right and center, <laughs> which is great. Cause as we've established, I don't think I would have done very well at hours trapped away revising. My brother was much better at that. I don't know, based on your driving test. <laughs> yeah, but that's quick experience. bursts, quick bursts. Well, that's, that was mine. I remember um, from my experience of uh, GCSEs, we had an anthology, an English anthology to go for our English literature GCSE and kick off, I won't say his name just in case, but um, his name was Nathan. Uh, we were in set in sets that spelled out my school name, Forrest. Right. I was in F and um, he was in T. First time I ever met him, he asked me what set I was in. And he said, I said, I'm in F. And he went, ah, oh, F is for thick. <laughs> so what are you in? He went T and walked off. Makes sense. There you go. So fast forward to uh, year 11, we're doing our GCSEs. And they throws up his English anthology after the exam onto the roof. And then, um, yeah, he was back in for another exam inside an hour on the same subject. <laughs> Crap. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, all your notes, everything just on the yeah. ceiling. So I don't know why ever happened to him, but God bless him. Anyway, um, <laughs> so that's really interesting. We have such different kind of experiences of education. Well, in that's general, I, don't. you know, I can't speak to my, I have a, and, and I'm very keen to say it. I have a very privileged experience because, you know, of the doors that dad opened. You also have a big privilege in that your parents saw you yes. and pulled you out, yeah. which is really, really privileged, to be honest, inside yeah. like education at large not many parents would have been able oh, to have seen that no massively i you know my a lot of my the reasons that my cousins locked them away to revise is because their parents made them you know the, the fear of god they instilled in them if should they fail these tests um but no my parents never really saw the point in the tests anyway and that was before you know before he could have opened you know before we moved to america and the ted talk happened and the, the nepotism really kicked in um, you know, my brother passed all of his exams in England, but it was always, 
you know, he got a scholarship to a school in Birmingham called Old Sumford when he was 13. And no one made him do that. It was, do you want to go to the school? In which case you've got to pass this test because that's the entrance. But at the same time, he was also touring with the RSC. My brother was in Richard III when he was 12. Um, so no, I, I have, you know, my parents were, we always had the bigger picture in mind, I think about, you know, what, and, and they were also okay with the fact that, you know, James was naturally talented at things like acting and he was very good at debate and, you know, he could have been a brilliant actor or a brilliant writer or a brilliant lawyer. And he had all these doors open to him and I had my fairies <laughs> for most of my childhood. And then my rollerblading and swimming and, you know, Disney channel. Uh, in the, in the later years, but I'd never really had a set direction and there was never any pressure to be like, okay, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? It was happy was the answer, you know, more often than not. And yeah. So no, I had, it was privileged in circumstances and privileged in parents for sure. Right. And still am. And now you're a published author. Yeah. Well, that was it. Yeah. yeah. Th- those school reports. And it was like Kate's failing English and American history and you know, French. And then I was reading, I was like, I'm a published author <laughs> and I got my American citizenship. So I passed all of those civics tests for re- in the real world and I speak French. So, ha, huh. but I, I, you know, learn at my own pace. <laughs> Fair enough. And also you apply a ferocious pace as well. So Susan yeah. also has asked because she was with us at the town hall um, that, and I guess it kind of dovetails there based on your experience and also mine. Um, She asks, uh, did you say you're about to start homeschooling? Can you explain why you decided to do this? Yes, we are about to start home educating um, our daughter, Adeline, who is, I keep saying five. She's not yet. She's nearly five. She'll be five in April. So she's in reception here in the UK. There are a number of reasons. I have always wanted to home educate. And I remember before we had Adeline, I don't even know if I was pregnant with her yet. No, we just had a great night. <laughs> and then, then, then I was pregnant with her. Or? Flipped it. No, that no, was a good night. Um, no, we, we talked about our, because you and I have different experiences. Yeah, massively. Obviously. Like if, if we could go to town on and yeah. the, the amount of experiences you've had where you just dropped like the Birmingham Ballet. And like, oh, yeah. Sorry. They are incredible stories and experiences yes. because you had, <clears throat> pri- well, not privilege, sorry, but you were privileged to have a big world kind of lens, a perspective that is yeah. big worlded. You can go and live wherever you like. Yes. You don't make your bed and like lie in it forever. How do they ever make my bed? Yeah. But that's a, that's a separate thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I can't imagine anything worse than thinking I had, I had to lie in a bed that I had just made. You're right. Yeah. So... Where's that coming in? Because our conversation that we had in, it must have been around 2016, 17, you're recalling, you're recalling the same conversation you and I had, where Which, yeah. I hadn't considered homeschooling, for well, instance. Well, yeah, I, I, the thought of putting a child in the school system kept me up at night. And actually, when we did find a school that we really loved for her, I still cried for 24 hours before she started. Um, but it's like, yeah, I was raised vegetarian. And so when it came to weaning Adeline... I couldn't sing Old MacDonald while simultaneously spooning her chicken. I just couldn't do it. And we had a big conversation because you were raised eating meat. For yeah. me, meat's been something you opt into and we do eat meat now. Adeline doesn't, but we do. Um, and for you, meat was something you just opt out. you opt out of. And it's- education for me was always something that, you know, I just couldn't imagine putting my kids into the system because I was so scarred by it. And, and I didn't want that for my kids. But then we found, you know, we we found the school for Adeline that's beautiful and has been, she's just come on so much and has been wonderful for her. And then we decided to move to London, um, which we were supposed to be doing in February this year. We're now pushing back a little bit and we found another school for her in London that I love just as much that I think would really be fantastic for her. And I always assumed I would home educate because I couldn't find a place I was comfortable at, like a kid going to school in. And then suddenly I have two schools and I still can't shake this. I, the only, I can sort of only describe it as being what people feel like when they're called to the church. Mm-hmm. It feels like a calling. And so if we just do it for a year, even it's, you know, we had, um, she's little, you know, she legally doesn't have to be at school until ne- in England until September. Um, Cause you start the term after you turn five, but most people start at four. And, you know, if she was in France, she wouldn't start till she was six. If she was in Finland, she wouldn't start till she was seven. So I'm not, She's so little. Um, and because the pandemic happened and dad died when she was two and a half, you know, and we got straight into work. We had a full-time nanny. 
Um, and then she started school and I just realized we haven't had that time together that, you know, I, I want her to travel. I want us to travel together and just to have that time to still be little because the school she's at is fantastic. Um, and they have a wonderful ethos about being real world ready and, you know, believe everything that we talk about, which is why we picked the school. Um, but even so, you know, she's, she's not yet five and she's growing up so quickly because she's in a school environment. And I just think if we can take a bit of time to, to home educate, to travel and to, you know, I, I want to spend the next year doing purely passion-based child-led learning, just follow her for a year and build curriculums and things we do around what her interests are and get to get to really kind of create that foundation as a family that we didn't get to because of life got in the way for it. Yeah. Um, also, and this is a big reveal, <gasps> I'm going to bang on the table. I have to move things. <laughs> I'm not going to show it off. No. Um, but we are, we're having another baby. We are. We are. So, um, which you can kind of see, let me, I will, I will show it off. Let's see. Kind of. Kind of. Kind of. <laughs> nothing really to show off yet <laughs> i'm only I four months bigger than <laughs> most of that's just christmas um, no i'm only four months pregnant but we are having a baby in july so she's going to be a big sister um and also i j that's another reason why it's why we're not moving to london in february but also why we're deciding to home educate yeah at this point um no this is going to be fun right because we are uh, i don't know many people know this but we're a blended family too so mm -hmm. i have a son from a previous relationship and um he's he was talking to me today about how he wants to be a football referee his, yeah. his interest in football has now moved to then authority again <laughs> that that tracks yeah it's um but he's a, he's a health and safety officer to be honest he runs gaff doesn't he really yes he's yeah when we went to a pet shop when he was six <laughs> there were rabbits and i suddenly realized that we were the adults and so no one else was going to say we couldn't get the rabbit and so i was like we could go no we came for fish but we could get a rabbit and Charlie, who was six, was like, we're not getting a rabbit. We're not getting a rabbit. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, you're probably right. That's a good, it's, it's a good decision. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's responsible. Like five in the Umbrella Academy, really, isn't he? He's, he's an old man. He's an old man in a tiny body. If anyone's seen that, it's really great. Um, so, yeah, but we are a blended family. So yeah. now we are, we're expecting one more. Yes. And so we're going to then take that time to then really kind of find our feet with our family experience. Basically, yeah. Aren't we? Yeah, Kate Dunn. Spend a bit more time being Kate Dunn. Kate Dunn. But also, don't worry, create a revolutionary. Oh, yeah. nothing, nothing will change after a while. I'll still crack the whip. Make sure <laughs> the content's ready. Next question, because I'm all I've got. I've got another interview in 10 oh, minutes. No, I'm sorry. just saying. 10? Yeah, one o'clock. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. Is it right? I'm sorry to everybody that I'm, I'm very much in demand. Yeah, you really are. Okay, Susan, so I hope I asked those questions for you. Um, yep. I'm going to go jump over to, oh, I wrote out Cassandra's because Cassandra um, was very lovely and left a video and I can't play that to you. She said two, two questions again. Um, what success stories of SKR's thinking implemented on a broad level do you have? Yep, so as I remember from having watched the video and I love your earrings, Cassandra, um, it was around sort of more wider scale so not just individual schools but bigger networks and um the you know he worked with governments like in singapore and in oklahoma and northern ireland and the uk with all our futures um but very much moved away from doing things on a government level not least i think because of his experience of all our futures but in the uk if you look at creative partnerships and the work through local authorities that came out following all our futures you know that was incredible during the labor government um, then there are things like big picture learning, which wasn't necessarily made inspired by him, but very much operates within, um, the same value system. And he was a big champion of that. And they have schools all around the world. So those were the ones that I would signpost you to at this point. Awesome. And she also then asked another question. What do you think is the most effective strategy to shift thinking and education? Um, which is another fantastic question. As I said, you know, dad had moved away from government work and and it's not something that i find to be effective at all either because you know you spend a lot of time campaigning certain government officials and then they move to another position particularly here in the uk or the government changes and you're kind of back to square one um i think the most effective way is still very much through the grassroots movement but there is now from my experience of parenting in school i would add that it's it's not necessarily about just campaigning schools and school systems and teachers Many of whom get it, you know, and you'll never find a teacher who went into teaching for the money of it. They went because it's a vocation and a calling. Um, but I think parent, there are a lot of parents who 
just don't understand how much the world has changed and how, you know, people think, well, I got through it. So it's your turn to get through it. And um, so for me, I think talking to parents is a really big next step that we haven't been doing enough of. And as ever involving young people in the conversation, because that is the true grassroots revolution. If you can get young people fired up about their rights, and um, of which they have many, if you look at the UN rights, the child, um, you know, that's, that's when the, I think the rumbles really start happening. I would love to see this community pick up those two threads as projects within mm-hmm. the project section. I just, I know obviously we have counterpoints, which is brilliant as a premise yeah. and something that we will then build upon. Build out. But then those, those two points you make in particular just really excite me. Yeah. Um, and like Charlie, we're very lucky in a way that, so for Charlie, he's got a great school in London that then educate kids in terms of their rights of the child. And he, he quotes yeah. it verbatim and says that's that one. He does. Which is rough at a By dinner. article. <laughs> rough at a dinner table, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? We're like, eat your bees and whatever. According to Article 17. Yeah, I don't have to eat my bees. But um, it would be really, really great to then build out more campaigns from our side, but also champion ones that already exist. So if anybody knows of ones that yeah. exist around those two threads that actually would really help, we'd love to then champion those. Yeah. I'm so sorry, I'm going to run through very quickly, but Penny Hay asks two questions okay. with three points. Ready? Oh, I'm ready. So if you could change the education system, what three things would you do first? Um, first, I would make use of technology to personalize it for every student because, you know, we put this in the book, but people say you can't personalize education because, you know, it's too complicated and too expensive. And the first point is that thanks to new technologies, it's not too complicated. And there are fantastic initiatives happening in schools daily that make great use of technology for personalized, keeping track of personalized learning. Um, And the second is that it may be expensive, but if you look at how much alternative programs cost to make up the shortfalls of formal education um, and actually invest those into the, into education from the get go um, so that you render those programs obsolete. obsolete. Um, it is an investment, not a cost. And surely that's what education must be anyway. Um, so it was the first thing I would make it more personalized. The second is I would give children much more of a voice in it and include them in the process because the average young person spends 22,000 hours in education from the start to the finish, not including kindergarten or college. Um, that is a lot of time to be told that you don't have a voice and that you're just one cog in a wheel. So I would give young people more voice. And the third is I would make less of it. Um, you know, now a research of homeschooling, the amount of time, certainly in elementary school that kids spend actually learning, um, you know, not to say they're not learning from life, but, you know, sort of actually absorbing information they're being told ranges from one hour to three hours a day, depending on, um, what stage they're at. And the rest of that time is discipline. It's moving from classroom to classroom. It's changing activities. It's going to the toilet. It's having lunch and things like that. Um, I think, you know, the... The 8.30 to 3 approach or the 8 to 3 approach in education five days a week is a lot for little people. And as they get older, maybe add more of it. But I think I would, um, yeah, I, w- I would, you know, we're talking about going down to four day working week. I think a bit more life balance for kids, particularly when you think of how oversubscribed a lot of them are. There are kids in Adeline's class now who are four years old with tutors at four, you know, and doing act- after school activities and extracurricular activities, sometimes three a day. Um, I would, I would just turn it back and make more space childhood and recognize that learning happens in in informal situations as much as it does in formal ones brilliant love that thanks thank you penny for that yeah thank you penny uh if you had three wishes for the future of your children what would they be okay i mean the first is happiness well i'm going to include the the obvious ones in the first the first is happiness safety and health um three of my favorite doors in snow (laughs) happy healthy and safety um no but that's just sort of the bubble around them that they can move through life in safety um the second is that i would wish that they don't lose their sense of self through life that it doesn't get bullied out of them by other kids or pushed out of them by society and that they can move through life in the world being the most authentic version of themselves um and the third is that they have adventures, you know, that they don't take, you know, I used to, we said before, I used to say to dad, not everything has to be a joke. And he'd say, it does though. And you think now he's gone. I'm really glad he made everything a joke. What a nice way to move through the world. 
Um, and I hope I would wish that for them as well, that they, they walk through life finding the funny side of it. And it's Catelyn Moran, who's a writer here in the UK who writes, I think for the Telegraph, she wrote a letter to her daughter recently, um, a couple of years ago, because she said she's been smoking a lot more. So she thought she might as well put everything down for her daughter just in case she dies. And one of them is that every experience in life can be chalked up to one of two things, either good things or terrible things that make the best stories that will have your girlfriends and stitches yelling no every time you get to the next twist of the story. Um, yeah. We've got plenty of those. <laughs> plenty of those. <laughs> um, my final question, I'm afraid I know that you're no, don't worry, don't short. Worry. Uh, after reading, hold on, one more thing. This comes from Phil, who has a fantastic group inside the Greater Revolution, for those that don't know, who is, um, books in particular are a big, big thing for us at the moment in the Greater Revolution, and that inspiring group there has then, we, I think I posted this, did I not? Be More Pirate, there we go, Sam Conniff, I should be on commission for that, but anyway, Phil has then said, after reading Be More Pirate, <laughs> I've been thinking about the stakeholders in education and also the forces that are heavily invested in maintaining the dysfunctional status quo. Where do you think the energies and skills of a group like this are best used? That's from Phil Morgan. Um, well, I would I'd be interested to have a conversation about this probably because I'd like Phil's opinion on this too. Um, but I, I make the point in Imagine If that everybody is a stakeholder in education because, you know, even if you don't have children going through it, you you live in a society that is shaped, <laughs> thank you, that is shaped by the results of education. So I think everybody's a stakeholder in education. Um, I think teachers are doing the absolute best that they can with, you know, there's strikes happening here at the minute and not a huge amount of support. And um, I, I, for me, I, I mean, I said it in the question for Penny, so I'm going to stick with that answer. I think that the two big stakeholders that are worth having a bit more love and attention are parents and young people. Um, because, and this is partly what, you know, the new book about the three worlds that we now live in, it's aimed at parents as much as it is at educators and carers. Um, because we are parenting and caring and educating now in ways that we never have done before as a species. You know, we were watching Frozen Planet, the David Attenborough documentary the other day about seal pups and how the parents take care, and the mum takes care of the seal pup for the first six months. That's not going to change really for seal pups, <laughs> they're, they, you know, their mums, as long as they have habitats still available to them, which may change or is changing. Um, parenting a seal pups sort of an age old tradition, but for us, we adapt and, you know, from the era of rock and roll onwards, it's kind of spiraled into this generational divide that keeps occurring. Um, but this, we, we have a chasm now rather than just a divide between parents who just don't know the world that their young people are growing up in because it's virtual and, and they didn't grow up in that world themselves. Um, you know, in an education, we do a really terrible thing. I think of saying that the virtual world has no business in the lives of our young people. You don't have your portable devices. You don't have social media. There's, you know, once in a while you get teachers and programs who make the best use of it as much as they can. Um, but yeah, I, th I think connecting with those two groups because they are ultimately going through education it's not, you know, not that teaching is ever just a job to anybody, but parenting and growing up doesn't work by school hours. Um, so engaging them in the conversation. Can be, well, I mean, it'd be awful for us if I didn't really agree, but. <laughs> no, it'd be an interesting dinner table an conversation. But I think, Phil, you make a really good, well, you pose a great question firstly and okay, you make a great point. I, I would you. like to expand that further. So perhaps we should build that out as a topic. Yeah, I would love to. Um, and then also maybe, thank you very much everybody for your question. Thank you. Um, I really do appreciate that. If those that um, didn't get a chance to then ask a question through me, um, then you can then do so and maybe we'll then do this again because this is the first of many and we had to kick off Great Revolution podcast with the Robinson in the room. <laughs> it only made sense to. Um, but also we'll be then adding this feature again of asking our guests personal questions ahead of time yep. which will be really useful so thank you very much for those that then jumped on that and then gave the questions but then for the next one if you want to kind of get involved we'll then do that and i would love to then ask you a couple of questions later down the line of not course. right now because you've got another commitment but you know where i live exactly i know where you <laughs> live i got everything down but thank you very much i really appreciate that and i know it's a bit different 
I know it's a bit strange. It was nice. But yeah, it was really fun just hanging out with you. I don't get yeah. a chance to do that. So, um, right, on that, thank you very thank much. Thank you very Robinson. much. Thank you, everybody, for sending your uh, Q&A. And um, we'll see you. Cheers. See you. <laughs>